Hi guys, welcome to lesson number two of Ethics, Governance and Sustainability. Let us look into the scope of this particular lesson. This lesson on ethics, ethical principles in business covers the code of business conduct and ethics, credo, ethics program, ethics committee, integrity pact, vigil mechanism, social and ethical accounting, ethics audit and ethical dilemma. So let us look into each topic one by one. Code of business conduct and ethics. So a company can have either a code of business conduct and a code of business ethics separately or a combined code which contains of the provisions on business conduct as well as the ethics. So as the name suggests, the code it's nothing but it's a compilation of all the rules, principles, techniques or such other kind of values which a company wants its employees to comply with. Right. So a company can document its perception in terms of the values which the company wants to possess and the kind of relations the company wants to maintain with its stakeholders is all covered into the ambit of code of business conduct and ethics. So in order to define it, we can call it as a one-stop document for all the board of directors and senior management to understand the importance or the value of the company. So usually before a person, before any uh, employee is joining a company is supposed to sign such code of conduct so employee code of conduct is one such document and in, in for the senior management and board of directors we have code of business conduct and the code of ethics which they have to comply with in day-to-day -day activities which they comply right and the need for such code of conduct has arisen because of tremendous increase of the corporate scandals inside the trading and misuse of funds by large corporates and right and, and also as a document this particular code of conduct contains core values and moral principles which the company expects its employees to comply with right so it as as this as said earlier this is a document wherein you know any person who is facing some kind of an ethical dilemma can refer to this particular code of conduct and understand this is what the company is expecting from me in terms of my duty as so and so employee Right? So this basically reflects the commitment of the company to ensure ethical behavior on its part and also the part of its member. Right? And as far as the Companies Act and the SEBI listing obligation disclosure requirements are concerned, the board of directors and the senior management shall on an annual basis submit an affirmation that they are complying with the code of conduct. Right? So this is one requirement which SEBI has stipulated, so which has an indirect requirement of basically the company having one code of conduct per se and such code of conduct shall be complied with by the directors as well as the senior management. Right? Credo. What is a credo? It basically is a statement as good as a mission or a vision statement. However, the mission and the vision statement target the public. So they target the, the external stakeholders. They tell, let them know that this is, why, this is what is the company's vision or this is what is the company's mission. However, credo is totally for the internal stakeholders, that is the employees to understand the importance of the stakeholders and not just that, but also of the services provided by the organization, right? And this credo helps the employees to boost their spirit, which, which it helps them to motivate themselves all the times whenever they are working for an organization, right? So in order to better understand this concept of credo, we should know the case study of Johnson & Johnson Tylenol crisis. So what happened in this particular case? Right? So in the year 1992, this particular drug Tylenol had been the market leader in terms of painkillers, right? But on one fine day, the, the media reported that seven people were killed or seven people died mysteriously after taking Tylenol. So the reasons for the same have been very difficult to ascertain. So uh, the, the media or the police were not able to understand the reasons for such deaths because this was the drug which had actually saved many lives. It was a life-saving drug which had turned to kill people. So how do, how do you think a company which is facing such a situation should react or respond? So Johnson & Johnson firstly looked at its credo. So as far as the credo of Johnson & Johnson is concerned, it simply says that the responsibility of the company towards the public, towards the customers is the top priority and then follows the, share, the profits or the well-being of the company. Anything follows only after the responsibility of the organization towards the people or the customers. Just by following it, Johnson & Johnson made a decision that it, ha it will withdraw all its products from across USA, from the length and breadth of USA, wherever they are, they have just withdrawn all the products. And then 
it replaced the Tylenol existing Tylenol packaging, which is tamp which has a scope of tampering, and it replaced it with a tamper-free triple safety seal packaging and introduced the product after six months. Right. So this way, it ensured that even though a billion-dollar product is brought back to the factories, which actually means loss, a big, huge monetary loss to the organization, it just didn't mind to get back the products. Right. So that was how Johnson and Johnson had faced this particular crisis of Tylenol, just because its credo had answered the question that you know my profits are my secondary aspects, but the quality which of services which I provide to my customers is what is the importance. So that is how the Johnson and Johnson had created value in terms of its services. Right. So this is about the concept of credo. Now let us understand the concept of ethics program training and communication and why did we club it together. So ethics program is like a schedule of events which a company should organize in order to ensure that its employees are trained in terms of certain ethical activities which they have to undergo and not just that during their business during I mean so during their course of employment they use they, they face certain dilemmas in terms of certain activities like someone may offer some good, good good price of money for them for the kind of information which they can share with others so they they may deal with confidential information they may deal with trade secrets they may have certain insider information with them right so how do they actually deal with such kind of situations and all will be trained through the ethics programs wherein the, the all the employees will have certain annual trainings and certain communication will be made to all the employees on a periodical basis right so few important things which we need to know under ethics programs are this is basically intended to ensure that the employees understand the values of the organization and it is one platform wherein the the role of the company so the company how does it look in terms of its ethics so either it can be a compliance oriented program or the values oriented program so either it can talk to the employees regarding the kind of compliances which the employee shall make or it can also stipulate the employees that these are the values which the company has and these are the values which the company is expecting the employee to comply with right and the, these ethics programs are designed usually on a periodical basis and predominantly or generally it would be an annual basis and regular reviews have to be made to understand or to monitor the kind of acceptance of such kind of values by the employees and finally this ethics program is intended at training educating and communicating the employees about the firm's ethical standards so this is the concept of a ethics program so ethics program is not like a stipulated one every organization can have its own kind of an ethics program and the kind of training and communication which the company provides to the employees depends upon the company to company and the size and scale of the company right so that is the concept of ethics now let us understand the concept of ethics committee so ethics committee per se is a not a mandatory committee but it is highly recommended for listed companies and also for large companies to have a committee by name ethics committee so what does this committee do so the basic the scope of this committee usually includes the framing monitoring and reviewing of the code of conduct so in the first slide we have seen the code of conduct of a company so code of business conduct and code of ethics of a company so code of business conduct code of ethics per se can be framed by a separate committee of experts who deal only with such kind of ethical activities. So they have the scope to frame it, to monitor it and to review it as well. Right? And to design the ethics program, that's the previous slide is talking about the ethics program. So this committee can be put to the responsibility of designing an ethics program and overseeing the implementation of such ethics program and to, to deal with ethical dilemmas faced by the company. It, you know what if any which are referred by the board of directors so wherever whenever board of directors refers any any kind of a transaction let us say board of directors are under the opinion that a transaction which the company is entering into has some kind of issue in terms of say related it may be a related party transaction wherein if they enter into such transaction they may they are of the opinion that it may lead to an unethical activity by the company favoring a particular person and all so in such cases instead of they taking a decision they may refer that case to the ethics committee and the ethics committee will analyze in terms of ethical attributes like by, by attributing the theories of ethics it will come to a conclusion whether that particular decision would be an ethical decision or an unethical decision and it gives this recommendation back to the board of directors right and again these are something which are not specified by any registration but these are what are expected out of such committee 
and in addition to it the due diligence of the prospect to employees to be recruited in senior management level can also be done through an ethics committee so they can pre you know, they can look into the cv of a particular employee who is being who will be appointed to a senior management person who is going to deal with certain critical information or critical uh, aspects of a company so when when such an employee is dealing with such a such critical information and when he is having such kind of a role in a company the kind of cv he is maintaining the kind of background he has the kind of background he is from and the previous employments which he has done any kind of misconduct in his previous engagements with any of his clients or any of the previous companies so these are all these all would be you know interviewed by the ethics committee and then the ethics committee will come to a conclusion whether or not to propose this person to the appointment right so this is this is a summary of the scope which an ethics committee can exercise and this can just widen integrity pact so the, the word pact means agreement so what is meant by integrity pact so integrity is something like you know people having being together right so integrity pact is basically a written agreement between a government or a government department and the bidders right so b- since there is an in an in any agreement you need more than one party so there are two parties in an integrity pact one would be the government or the government department and the other party would be the bidder who who is bidding for some tenders which are which are issued by a government so the situation is that there is a government which is coming up with a tender and you are going to bid for the tender and when you are bidding for the tender instead of bribing you know usually there are many practices which many many companies undergo by bribing the government authorities and then making sure the tender comes in his name right so this is one agreement whereby both the parties agree that they are going to refrain from the bribery and collusion so this is one like you know hypothetical kind of a situation but still technically this is what it is so whenever they are entering whenever they are bidding so they agree saying that they are not they have not bribed any government employee nor they are nor are they going to bribe any government employee in future and the government also agree saying that we haven't received any bribe nor are we going to accept any bribes for this particular tender so what do you think are the benefits of out of this right so this basically and initially would ensure that the government's accountability in public contracting process is increased and the other benefits are for the companies there would you know it is assured that there is fair competition which is existing and hence they can depend on their competency score competency rather than at lobbying with government employees and as far as the government is concerned it is cost saving because if they are accepting the bribe it means they would somehow benefit the person who is giving the bribe which again internally means that the government's cost on that particular project is definitely going to increase so this particular integrity pact is going to reduce the cost for the government and finally for the citizens there would be a better quality of service which they can expect from the government right so this is the concept of integrity pact now let us discuss in detail the concept of vigil mechanism so what is a vigil mechanism vigil mechanism means the calling the attention of the top management to some wrong doing occurring within an organization so this is also referred to as whistle blowing and this has been arrived from the britishers using the concept you know using the, using whistles whenever they found a crime or whenever they found a crime they used to just blow the whistle so that is how the whistle blower mechanism has come and very recently it has entered into the corporate world so what is meant by whistle blowing so assume you are working in an organization and you come across some kind of a fraud which the company is take which the company is actually undergoing right so or maybe some part of the company or maybe some some employees some group of employees are planning for some kind of a fraud which would impact the company's financials or other company's reputation right in such a case you can take the responsibility of calling the attention of your top management let them know that see this is what they are planning to do and then intimate them as to the kind of wrong which is occurring within your organizations and this is the concept of whistle blowing and the person who blows such whistle is referred to as a whistle blower he can be your employee he can be a former employee he can be member of any other organization he can be a government agent or he can be any external stakeholder and he shall have the willingness to be take the corrective action on such misconduct within the organization right the best case study available for whistle mechanism is that of enron so enron was a major giant in the us which was into almost all the businesses all the businesses possible 
right? And on one fine day when they were expanding their business as a conglomerate into broadband services, then there was a there was a kind of a feeling within the organization that the company is somehow not doing good. And then one senior vice president had made it open to the board of directors saying that the company is actually concealing something and the kind of fortune which the company has, it cannot afford for a new business per se. Right? And after that whistle being blowed by the senior vice president, the complete company per se has crashed, the stock markets have crashed and it has become a bigger scam or bigger scandal in the USA. Right? So let's, now let's look into certain types of whistleblowers. Right? So where the fact of a misconduct has been disclosed to the top management within an organization, it is called as an internal whistleblowing. Where the same fact of misconduct is disclosed to external regulator, external agents like regulators or government, then it comes under external whistleblowing. And where such whistle has, where such misconduct has been or such wrongdoing has been intimated by a former employee, then we call it as alumni. And where the identity of the person has been revealed, we call it as open whistleblowing. And where such wrongdoing is only in terms of an individual or a personal identified person, then it is a personal whistleblowing. But where you know, the wrongdoing is going to harm others, not just a single person, then we call it as impersonal whistleblowing. And where the wrongdoing is pertaining to any acts of a government agent or a government per se, then it is called as government whistleblower. And then where it is with respect to corporates, where the wrongdoing is with respect to corporates, then we call it as corporate whistleblower. Right? So these are the types of whistleblowers. As far as the Companies Act and the LODR are concerned, Section 177 of the Companies Act and Regulation 22 of LODR deal with the concept of vigil mechanism. More or less, the requirements are the same. So firstly, they need a whistle mechanism in place, a policy which talks about the whistle mechanism and it shall protect the victimization of such whistleblowers. So they, the, the person who is coming out and disclosing a misconduct should not be put to threat is what is the intention behind these two provisions. Let us look into the applicability of the same in terms of section 177. So since a listed company, any listed company per se, a whistle mechanism is mandatory. In addition to such listed company, the following classes that is so such companies which accept deposits and those companies which have the borrowed money from the banks and the public financial institutions in excess of rupees 50 crores, the concept of whistle mechanism is mandatory. And such mechanism shall provide for adequate safeguards against the victimization of whistle blows, right? And then it should also provide for direct access to the chairperson of the audit committee. So as far as the Companies Act is concerned and the LODR also is concerned, this whistle mechanism shall provide for direct access to the chairperson of the audit committee. In addition to this, the requirement of disclosures are that the existence of a policy and also the policy per se shall be disclosed in the website and the details of such policy shall be disclosed in the annual report. So this is the requirement of visual mechanism under section 177 of Companies Act and Regulation 22 of the SEBI LODR regulations. Now let us deal with the concept of social and ethical accounting which is not a technical aspect per se which is not ha which has not been defined by any regulation it is just it is still a theory so what is a social and ethical accounting so it is the process of defining observing and reporting the measures of ethical behavior and the social impact of an organization in relation to its aims and those of its stakeholders so this is a kind of a broader definition which is given to social and ethical accounting. In order to be very precise, social and, and ethical accounting is about is, is bas basically talks about the accountability of a company in terms of its activities and the impact of it, the kind of social impact it has towards the society and towards the stakeholders that will be recorded in terms of uh, ethical accounting. The format per se is not prescribed, there is no standardized form. However, there is one standard which actually deals with such kind of social and ethical accounting reporting strategies. What is that? That is AA1000. So AA1000, the accountability principle standard is one, is the first global standard which has come in the year 2008, which focuses on securing the quality of social and ethical accounting, auditing as well as reporting, right? And it covers issues like economic performance of the company, working conditions existing within the company, environmental 
environmental measures taken care by the company, such animal protection or wildlife protection taken by the company, human rights, the protection of human rights or prevention of misuse of human rights by the company, fair trade that is kind of thing about the competition, you know, fair competition which the company undergoes, ethical trade, so during its trade, be it in the marketing or be it actually selling the products, it actually is doing something which is ethical in nature and HR management should be vital and the community development, it should ensure it is undergoing proper corporate social responsibility initiative so all these aspects are measured in terms of the social impact they have towards the society so that is what is a social and ethical accounting and what is an ethics audit so as the name suggests you are basically auditing something so what is it that you are auditing you are auditing the activities of the company and you are looking into whether such activities are actually leading to such ethical consequences or unethical consequences and as well as the acts which the company has undertaken to achieve such consequence whether the act per se is ethical or not so over here the concept of theories of ethics is very important so based on which theory your company adopts it will analyze whether the activity of a company is ethical or not so as far as the ethics audit is concerned it is a process of auditing the activities of the company in terms of ethical parameters and not financial parameters as a standard traditional financial audit right and all whatever be the transactions undertaken by the company during the year which are material in nature all of it will be identified and then each of the transaction will be audited to determine if there is any scope of an unethical activity which the company has undertaken for the purpose of completing such transaction right and it is something which brings together all the factors which impact the company's reputation and examines the way the company is doing its business right and you know to be to be Practically enough, not many companies have adopted ethics audit. The reason for that is there are no proper guidelines or standards in this regard. Right? So let us look into certain, let us look into certain steps which are involved in an ethics audit. Steps number one would be firstly to to let the top management commit themselves that yes, we wish to know the kind of ethical activities which we are taking taking which are taking place in the company and not just that we would also want to know whether the activities the company has undertaken whether they are ethical or not so that is the first step you should firstly secure the commitment of your top management in terms of the ethics audit number two is to for you to establish a committee or a team which focuses only on this audit number three is to identify the scope of the audit so this scope of the audit would be like you know uh, getting a materiality threshold that is only those transactions where the monetary considerations are more than one crore or two crores like that you will understand you will crystallize or you will determine the scope of your audit and then you will review the existing mission va values or the goals or the principles policies which are existing in place within the organization you will try to review it you will look into what are the expectations in terms of the code of conduct, in terms of the principles, regulations or in terms of other policies adopted by the company. And then you will collect the information by way of having one-on-one -on -one interviews with the employees, by way of looking into the bills, invoices and all, you will try to collect the information. And then you will analyze the information and get the results also analyzed by an independent party. And finally, you will submit a report of all your findings to the board of directors. So these are the steps involved in an ethics audit, right? So right from securing the commitment until again, and then you give back the report back to them. So that is what is an ethics audit about. And finally, what is an ethical dilemma? The word dilemma itself means you are thinking whether to do this or do that right now we have dilemmas right from you know simple thing like choosing a movie which movie to go this or that right and also right you know the critical aspect say you two companies selected then which company to choose this or that and also if you want to do a profession which profession to do this or that ca or cs cs or cwa right so all these are nothing but examples of dilemma then what is the ethical dilemma so in all the decisions you make whether this decision is ethical or this decision is ethical or of those two which is more ethical right suppose you have a choice of going to an organization which is having proper systematic things in place but is paying you very less but you go for another organization which is doing totally unethical activities but is ready to pay you really good so the options available for you are two one a company which is good in terms of its values but is paying you lesser than the other company which is not that good in terms of its 
values but it's ready to pay you more money so which to choose right which one to choose this is exactly the situation called as ethical dilemma right so this ethical dilemma basically involves the means to choose from among two or more morally acceptable course of action so either this can be accepted or so this can be accepted there are particular reasons for you to accept any of the option but you have a dilemma as to which one to opt for that is when you need to take certain things certain measures to understand that you are in the con you are in the middle of an ethical dilemma and you are supposed to resolve such ethical dilemma right and ethical dilemma usually would be a right versus wrong situation and in such a situation there is always a conflict between your moral imperatives and in that case it is very difficult for you to resolve the situation right and that's the reason why it is also referred to as ethical paradox then what are the steps involved in resolving an ethical the steps involved are number 1 firstly consider all the options available for you option 1 option 2 this company that company that company get all the options available number 2 start identifying the consequences of each of the option if i go for this option what is my consequence it may be negative or a positive but identify all the consequences which you can have for each of your options and then analyze the action to be taken for each of the options suppose you're going ahead with this then what kind of action you need to take and what kind of you know also keeping in mind the consequence so if i'm taking this particular action that is what is my consequence if i'm opting for this particular option that is my consequence this is what i'm supposed to do in order to opt for this particular option right so after doing all that then you will decide one particular option based on the above analysis which usually will give you a better consequence and a lesser you know lesser uh less immorality or like i can i can say it as a more or greater moral principles which you can adopt right so you will choose for one option based on the entire analysis which you did in step number 1 2 and 3 and finally whatever be the option which you have taken you start evaluating it on a periodical basis and then see if there is any op- if there is any way i mean if suppose you feel that this is, option is something which i should not have opted for then you should go back to step number 1 and again start off with it right so firstly you should identify all the options and then start looking at the consequences be it positive or negative and then start analyzing the kind of action you need to take for that particular option and then in you know, keeping in mind all the three you need to under you need to decide on one particular option and go ahead with it and then start evaluating such particular decision on a periodical basis in case you feel that the decision you have taken is turning out to be unethical then there is no worry you can just drop it down there and again come back to step number 1 and start analyzing the other available options this is the concept of ethical dilemma and the steps involved in ethical dilemma and with this we are done with lesson number 2 thank you